political ideology is very important. In fact, it drives a lot of what motivates people. And in Hermosa Beach, as you know, these elections <coughs> are not about being a Democrat or a Republican. They're about being a Hermosan. And my goal and my core campaign message is to put Hermosa Beach first. I want us to focus on things that make this town better, and that by being visible and usable, and things that we can identify as that we did. For example, the $800,000 we talked about earlier on the Caltrans project that we spent, that we got nothing for, that money could have been to refurbish and re uh, do the community centers. So I want our tax dollars diverted to actual projects that make this town better. Sewers, roads, Greenbelt, city cleanliness, all of the above, but I don't want it wasted on things that we don't get anything for. So my political ideology is to put Hermosa Beach first and focus our efforts, energy and time, on doing things that make this town better. Thank you. Mayor. Thank you. Um, I think political ideology is not particularly important when you're in a role to govern a community. So I had this question on a questionnaire for the voters edge. It's just information. It's not a partisan anything by the League of Women Voters. I'm going to read a little bit. Public governance is a sacred trust for the community that it represents. I firmly believe in setting up the circumstances to ensure that everyone with an opinion has the opportunity to be fully heard and considered in the key decisions that impact the community. Inclusiveness always brings about the best possible outcomes in my experience. And while it is impossible to please everyone in every instance, my hope and intentions as a candidate for city council seat in Hermosa Beach are that we will work together uh, toward an ever brighter future by leveraging all of our skills, all our talent, all our heart, all our will to shape the future so that the community can get fully behind the deci final decisions that are made as neighbors who respect one another and also respect the process. It's focus, balance, give and take, mutual respect, and goodwill. And that's the key to getting. Thank you. Okay, I've got one last question. And then I'm going to amend the rules again. <laughs> We're still going to end early. We're going to end before 9. But after the two candidates answer this last question, I'm going to offer the opportunity for two members of the audience to ask a question. And the first two people whose hands I see, I will pick to ask a question. So start thinking. And um, is that okay with everybody? All right, thank you. You're all very good work. I appreciate it. No, I'm amending them. There's a disclaimer in the rules. <laughs> all right. um, all right, last question for me. What value does Fiesta Hermosa provide to the community, and what is your vision for Fiesta Hermosa going forward? Stacy. All right, you picked the right city council member. All right, um, so we just formed a uh, Fiesta subcommittee with two council members partnering with some staff in the chamber. Um, really, it's not for me to decide what I think of Fiesta Hermosa. It's about engaging the public and understanding what they want in the Fiesta, what they like, what they don't like, what they're indifferent about. Um, but really, we're, we've met one meeting, but I can hopefully reveal some of the outcomes of that. Um, they're not secrets. Our hope is to have a town hall where we engage the community and gather public input. Um, again, just to hear what the community thinks about the fiesta, where we could do better, where we should stay the same, um, where we could do things differently. Um, and also, really, I think the fundamental question is the community has never been asked what they think of the fiesta. And so this is our opportunity to partner with the chamber and to listen to the residents and see if we can do things differently. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pete Tucker. Uh, thank you. As I began this debate on um, thanking the chamber for what they've done with a lot of our civic activities, um, that's one thing that they do by the fundraising at the, at the fiesta. That's very important. St. Patty's Day Parade, Christmas, and things like that. It also helps charities uh, raise money in the beer garden. That's a lot easier than some of these fundraisers that we've had to do. But really, the chamber out of the Fiesta gets money to promote the city, and they get money to help the businesses, 
but really that they're our ambassador and they need to work with everyone and uh, promote our, our city. But to take the, the fiesta away, I think would be a, a tragic mistake. I think people do enjoy it. It shows off our city to visitors and the residents like it. And there's a lot of people who are uh, vendors at the fiesta that live here in the South Bay or in, um, in Hermosa Beach especially. So I think we need to really look hard if we are going to change it, but I think it's been around for over 35 years now. And I think uh, people enjoy coming down here and, and enjoying our community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> we got the first two. White hat yeah. and black. <laughs> 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 Have a good, good guy. All right. And what I'm going to do is. Um, <clears throat> We'll have everybody answer it, and I'll draw the names in order. Oh, and we have a mic for you. Thank you very much, Ryan. Okay, so I'm Michael Bean. Um, first one of these things I've come to, so I really appreciate all of you spending your time. Uh, I've noticed quite a few uh, transients down at the beach in the morning, camping out, sleeping there. I actually reached out to the police, went down uh, to the police station, and asked what can be done about it, or what is being done about it. And they told me really the only thing I can do is call prior to six, long prior to six, uh, report it, and then hopefully the police get there before six, because after that it's not a thing. So what can be done about that, and or if nothing should be done, is it okay? Pete Tucker. Um, One minute apiece. Okay, thank you. Yeah, the transgender problem is is a problem, but a lot of those people choose to live that way, as much as we hate to say. Um, in changing the hours, I think that's what we need to probably should do, but that might involve the Coastal Commission or something like that, because they're on the beach. We don't have our local coastal plan yet, but that's something we need to look at. I know there's some businesses down there to help uh, with the outreach. I know the, uh, uh, John, at the, uh, one of the tattoo parlors, does a lot of outreach for them, but it's a problem that we all need to try to understand. It's very hard to solve this problem. Uh, we can help them as much as we can. And uh, there's a lot of cities where they have a lot of places where they feed the homeless. But all in all, I mean, it, it is a safety. We've had a lot of crime down there. And we, we need to patrol it. And I'm sure that somehow the police department can figure out how maybe we can cite them or, or find refuge for them for that night, but I think it's something we need to do to make our city safer. Thank work you. on that problem. Thank you. Stacy. Uh, we have a partnership, I think it's with the Department of Public Health, where we have um, a clinician that actually travels alongside our police officers, I think it's one day a week, to work with our local homeless population. Um, I've witnessed some of the scary situations with some of our homeless and the patrons and residents uh, in Pier Plaza as recently as this last weekend. Um, we need to approach it in a way, first and foremost, with compassion. And that's what we have equipped our police officers with the resources to do so. But at the same time, we've also had, unfortunately, a homeless person um, staff an employee at a local establishment. And there are some dangerous um, transients out there and we need to properly arrest them. Thank you. Matt. Thank you, Julie. Uh, I would approach this problem just as I would anything as far as what I do with my professional careers. I always reach out to subject matter experts and get their opinion. Uh, Santa Monica deals with this on a very, very high level. Fortunately, we actually have a, happen to have a Santa Monica police officer who is a resident here on Most Beach. I will give out his name right now. But he's somebody who deals with this on a day-to-day -day basis in Santa Monica. I would actually reach out to him and ask him, hey, how can we deal with this? I wouldn't want to go ahead and dictate policy without contacting and dealing with an expert on, on, the, on the matter. So that's how I would handle that situation. Thank you. Thank you. Trent. Yeah, the homeless issue is is not pretty to deal with. It is it is a problem, and everybody who sees the homeless feels lots of different things for them and about the situation. And no one, I think, likes it, including myself. I I don't like it, and I don't want the homeless in and around our beach towns. 
down around the pier, anywhere really in town. I believe we passed a, a, a measure in Los Angeles to help fund additional resources to help the homeless. And so I would be in favor of doing what we can to essentially remove the homeless from the beach area, the strand area, wherever they are, and get them some help that they need. Because most of them, as you know, are drug addicted or mentally ill, and they really do need help. They don't, you know, most people don't choose to be homeless. So it's a difficult situation, and I would do everything I could to try to help alleviate it. I don't have all the answers right now, but I would certainly work together. Thank you. Mary. Thank you. Um, I actually had this question from another resident as well, and so I um, talked to um, a few people about it. So I do know that our officers have had specialized training in how to deal effectively with our homeless population, and we do keep track of them. We know who they are. We know how many of them that we have. Um, I, I, I've got to just echo Stacy. It has to be from a position of complete human compassion that we deal with our homeless population. And I think we need to differentially deal with what, what we have in the individuals because some of them, a lot of them, uh, have severe mental Ill, illness problems. They may be just off medication, but this is a, a trend. Some are on drugs, some are otherwise. But I think that they, they need a nuanced, approach for services. I know that we have a couple of resources where we can um, transport our homeless in times of need or need for shelter. I think it's Inglewood and, and uh, Long Beach, if I'm not mistaken. So I think we've got to uh, have a nuanced approach. Thank you. Thank you. And last but not least, Kenny. Thank you. Um, so uh, I was involved in the homeless count that our city did this year um, and all the South Bay cities did, but we, we had it here in Hermosa Beach for Manhattan and Hermosa and City Hall. I was participated participated with some of the volunteers to go out there and actually do the head count of the homeless people in Hermosa Beach. It took several months for the information to come back from the county, but we have 19 homeless people that were at least uh, counted in, in February. Um, and homelessness is not a crime, so it's just issues that we have to deal with and we have to address. One of the things that I also serve in the South Bay Council of Government's Homeless Committee uh, that deals with these issues. And we have several things. We have somebody that works with works our police department that's specifically trained to address these issues and go out and, and help these people. We also have a, an organization called PATH, P-A-T-H, it's funded by Supervisor Janice Hong. And their job is to go actually and, and contact these homeless individuals and try to get them help. In 2016, last year, unfortunately, they were able to only house one person out of Hermosa Beach. Uh, last year we had 20, and now we have 19. I don't know if it's exactly the same people or not, but uh, it's very, very tough to get them to do that. And then lastly, we also, um, there's one individual that I know has been homeless for the last few months. Uh, we can also reach out to the Beach City's Health District. They, the people are dealing with health issues, the Beach City's Health District can, can also help them as well. Thank you. All right, last question from the man in black. Ray Salt. So uh, a little bit ago, Mr. Armado uh, mentioned a subcommittee working that's bringing together residents, businesses, and council members to work on uh, ideas about Fiesta. Um, I've noticed a lot of subcommittees like that formed over the years. I've been going to council meetings for nine years. Um, I've noticed in the last couple years that those, all of those commissions have the same group of people in every one of them. Um, and typically they just echo whatever the current council has already decided they want to do. Um, also, I've noticed that when things get controversial like CCA and carbon neutrality issues. Um, the items come up on the end of council meeting agendas or council members will propose to shift them so that people won't stay long enough to comment on it. And finally, I've also seen um, that when council doesn't want to address the issue that people have raised, they, they will uh, try as much as they can to minimize the voices they're going to hear. So my question after all of that is, Give me a break. is what would you do to increase the diversity of input and the diversity of voices from the community um, when it comes to commissions and uh, speaking at council? Matt. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Ray. Ray, uh, I'm glad you brought this question up. It's actually been a concern of mine for about a year. I, uh, I've noticed this on many 
subcommittees that we do, we do see the same regular players. I, I noticed this primarily when we saw the uh, fire service community group that got together. It was never transparent about how that group got together. There was never really any information about how people could apply for that. You see this a lot. Uh, you see this with Access Formosa. You don't know who's in the group. You're not, you don't know, I would love to get involved, but you don't know who's involved with that. There are many other groups. It's the same thing, and these subcommittees, they're not transparent about whose names are there. I say the biggest issue that we probably have in the city council right now is, is people who come there every night and voice their opinion, but there's people in this community whose voice is not being heard because they have businesses to run at night, they got families to take care of, and it seems like a small vocal minority really is dictating policy and stuff. Thank you. Pete Tucker. Well, thank you. Uh, these committees should have diversity, uh, whether they're business owners or even residents and, and renters too. Uh, we need to advertise better. We need to publicize some of these uh, committees or advisory task force uh, better than we have. Uh, I think uh, one problem I know is, and I've heard it before, is we need to stick to the agenda, the council agenda. Things get juggled around. I know we had. Two study sessions canceled when we were talking about the, the plan or the general plan, and then one whole council meeting was canceled. People plan that. In the study session, there's no legislative action. They, they could have had those meetings. But I think all in all, we need to listen. We need to learn to uh, collaborate with our fellow council people and, and get some consensus. And, and really, maybe sometimes cross over and say, "Yeah, that's a good idea." I know the majority of my People don't like that of my followers, but I'm going to vote this way because it's what's best for the community. And that's what I will do, is whatever's best for the community. That's how I will vote. Thank you. Thank you. Stacey. Um, I think we can always do a better job of listening to public input and feedback. And if the general perception is that people don't believe there's proper diversity on what I think you were referring to are some of our task forces and committees that have been established. A lot of times that's established by the city and city manager and um, people that maybe have reached out to him personally. Um, but we could do a better job of making sure people know what task forces or committees are being established and their opportunities to be able to participate and engage. A lot of times we find that People say they want to get involved and unfortunately aren't really willing to roll up their sleeves and meet every other week, every month, etc. But certainly if you or anyone else wants to get involved, we can do a better job of um, engaging you. Um, but I also want to, um, we, we don't, uh, I certainly don't minimize voices and I want to point to an example where, you know, really listen to community input when it came to the question of carbon neutrality. That was a hot topic in town, and I think that our council heard our community, and we changed those goals to be carbon reduction goals. So to say that we don't value community input and we only listen to a few people in town, I don't subscribe to. That. Thank you, Mary. I uh, I feel very very strongly about inclusiveness. It's part of the work that I do, and what I understand about inclusiveness when you're trying to move forward as a team, as an organization, or as a city and community, is that we are only going to be able to forward our best possible collective ideas if we have everyone at the table. The city belongs to all of us. We all live here. We all should have a voice in the process. We should, anything that's critical, we, and, and then it's only then, when we come to a final decision, in my experience, that we will be able to get behind those decisions. If we haven't heard the voices uh, that, that want to be heard, we're going to feel the division, we're going to feel the discord, it's toxic, it's negative, and it's unhealthy. And so I would work to try deliberately to ask questions. Who are we missing? Who else needs to be at this? And if, if it's happening, ha and a lot of people volunteer, it's a little haphazard, that's not good enough. And I, efficient council meetings, is a, I would be a huge champion for because I think it's a disservice to have meetings that go so late that it's a discouragement. Sorry. Thank you. Kenny. Uh, so some of the task group, uh, the groups that uh, Ray is referring to, um, for the most part, are selected by the city manager. 
Uh, the team may get input from council members if he wants to, but I know the two examples that I just think of recently, the Access Formosa and the Fire Services groups, I had no input on who the people that were in those groups, and frankly, on specifically on fire services, I know I've heard from people, some of them are here today, that they went into with this group with some mindset and they ended up voting the opposite of what they thought, so they weren't picked for a specific outcome or result, is my understanding. Uh, I'm totally supportive of transparency, you've heard that before, for people who's on that group, and I've raised this issue with our city manager, we should post that information on the website so everybody knows what, who's in the group so you can reach out to them and give them input. Um, I've had my community first meetings for the last two years where I get a chance to let people know what's going on with things coming up so people express interest, I can let them know who in the city they can talk to to uh, participate more. Um, and then also the city's doing a good job, we can do better, about announcing things that we have going on on Facebook. Events coming up, things that are happening, and maybe what we can do is add to that things regarding uh, task forces or commission appointments so everybody on social media can also know and if they're interested they can notify somebody in the city staff. Thank you. Last but not least, Trent. Okay. I think the Fiesta Hermosa is a fantastic tradition of Hermosa Beach. It kicks off the summer and ends the summer on Memorial Day and Labor Day. And we get a lot of visitors to our town during the summer. And it really drives traffic to our businesses that holds over throughout the year. People come to Hermosa from all over the South Bay to enjoy the Fiesta Hermosa. And they keep coming back because they really appreciate that we have the best fiesta. And in regards to commissions and boards and things like that, I think we have to be careful on how many we actually assign. Because I really think that's the job of the council. And I think if we focused on Hermosa and didn't focus on things such as the CCA and carbon neutrality, but we focused on what we do here locally, that we would have time as a council to talk about this and tell you how I feel how we feel. So I believe the Hermosa Fiesta is a fantastic tradition and that it, we need to be careful on how many boards and commissions we set up, period. Thank you. All right, so now we're going to kick it over to the candidate closing statements. And I am going to expand your time by one minute. So you just have two minutes to respond. You don't need to fill that two minutes. If you want to make it one, that's perfect. And then we are going to get done. So, with that, Stacy. Thank you, Julie, and the Chamber, and to my friends and colleagues here for your consideration. I've committed to meeting regularly with residents and business owners as often as it takes to get problems resolved and move ideas forward. So, I'm very thrilled that so many of you are here today. Hermosa is a mix of long-term and short-term residents, local business, men and women, commuters, and those working from home, young professionals barely affording their rent, moms and dads and their kids, and the one thing you always come away with is that people love living in Hermosa Beach. What people say over and over in one way or another is that Hermosa is a community, not just a city, that they live in a neighborhood and not on a street. And that they walk to dinner on a Friday night and they feel safe and secure when they come home from work. Retaining that sense of place while trying to navigate the inevitable forces of change, it's a challenge. It'll take creativity, hard work, financial prudence, the willingness to say yes when change is right, but to also be able to stand firm when change is not. There'll be a lot of work ahead of us in the next five years, but I'm up for the challenge. I've committed myself to Hermosa Beach in every way you can imagine. We own a home here, my husband owns a business here, and my kids attend the amazing schools here. I hope to earn your vote to provide that sensible voice to move our city forward with pride and to continue to serve the community. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming tonight. I believe this has been very informative, and I really think I feel the participation of the audience. I thank you for that. Some of the things you might not know about me is that I've been in Hermosa Beach homeowner since 2003. I moved to the South Bay in 1984. I've been married to the same woman for 25 years, and I have a daughter who attends Redondo Union High School. I have coached AYSO girls soccer at spring and fall since 2013. Uh, my last 
season, I won the championship, and I had 22 9th and 10th grade girls on my team. Um, I have worked at the same company since 1988. I am a frontline go-getter salesperson who calls on enterprise accounts the who's who of Los Angeles. Recently, I got myself promoted into the public sector. So all I call them is public sector accounts. So there's a lot of synergies with me running for office, which is good because it really motivates me to do a great job as your elected official. I believe that we should make Hermosa Beach better, and I've said this multiple times, but I want to spend our tax dollars on visible, usable improvements that we can all benefit from and we can point to as an accomplishment that we've done. And, you know, an easy, low-hanging fruit, there's a lot. There is a lot. I mean, we have not, we have put off maintenance for years and years and years chasing things that didn't come to anything. I want to support our businesses and bring in new businesses like Skechers, the Strand and Pier. I want to preserve our small town character and charm that is unique to Hermosa. No one else has this in this area except us. I believe we have a huge heart in Hermosa, that we and I and you, we are the heart of Hermosa. If you look into my eyes, you can feel my heart. I care deeply about this community, and I will make an excellent councilman if you put me on this council. Thank you very much. Hanny. Um, so, um, my wife, I think, was here today. Oh, well, she was. Um, my wife, Dina, and I decided to move here about 10 years ago. We, we were in North Redondo at the time, and we just uh, spent a lot of time here in Muscle Beach, fell in love with it. Uh, so we decided to, uh, to move here. Uh, we were here with our two kids, uh, have a son and a daughter, and, and love this community and plan to be here the rest of our lives. Um, as far as my background, I'm an engineer by background, I'm now a practicing lawyer, and I have this uh, over 25 years of uh, experience dealing with uh, legal and then development issues that I think have been helpful in my service on the council. Um, over the last four years, um, I think we've done on the council, we've got a lot done, and I think I, I speak for um, all five of us that are on the council now, uh, and uh, people that were there um, for two years ago. Um, we had, um, I've talked about this a couple times already, that oil, oil litigation and oil issues have been going on for decades, and we put an end to it. This is behind us, we're never going to deal with it, with it again. Uh, sewer problems that have been going on in the city. I mean, people, staff have told us some of the areas in the city that are sewer problems are uh, 40, 50 years old. We funded the sewer improvements. We don't have to deal with this again. I mean, it's going to be before us on our council on Tuesday, and there's a lot of work to be done, but all the funding is done, all the planning is done. We don't have to deal with it again. Our fire services has been deteriorating for years, and it's been going on uh, with various options that have been presented to prior council. We put an end to this. We contracted with LA County for improved fire service, and we funded a new uh, a fire building. So we've got a lot done over the last four years. We've also funded over the last four years more than $25 million of infrastructure improvements uh, across the town. Uh, some of it is in the planning and still going to be implemented. Going forward, we have a lot more to do. As I mentioned in my introduction, we have uh, more infrastructure improvements that we're going to be talking about on Tuesday that we're going to hopefully implement. We have more. Uh, improvements that we need to do in public safety because we have issues that uh, have been raised that we need to address. We also have private developments that are going on that are in the process, including the hotel and the Skechers. And uh, we look forward to working with the school district to uh, make sure that we have safe, adequate schools for our kids going forward. Thank you. Pete Tucker. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, I want to thank my wife, Sienna, for given me the opportunity to run for this office, to represent you, the residents, and to re represent our city. I really love Hermosa, and I always have. Uh, tonight we heard a whole lot about code enforcement actions. The reason the code enforcement are acting the way they are is because that's direction from the city council to the city manager. The employees do not do this on their own. They're instructed to do this by the city manager. Hermosa has an incredible lifestyle, and together we can protect the local environment, promote businesses, and address our infrastructure needs through reasonable programs that never lose sight of our heritage and our beloved beach culture. I ask you to visit my website, electpetertucker.com, for more information or questions you might have of me. I hope on November 7th, I will earn your vote 
to be your representative on the Hermosa Beach City Council. Thank you all for attending. Thank you, Julie. Um, what a good thank everybody for coming out. I appreciate the community engagement on this. This is a very important election. I really think that we're, this is a pivotal time for our city in the direction that we're going to take, take our city. We've, as, as I expressed earlier, we have four environmental activists on our current city council, and I believe they're taking us in the wrong direction. This is why I got involved. I first got involved is I mentioned my fire service background. And I was really intrigued to find out why our fire service and why our fire station got to a point where it got. When I got involved, I realized that this city was pursuing an aggressive environmental agenda. It goes on beyond solar panels, carbon neutrality, and CCA. If you want to learn about it, go ahead and Google the Green Idea City. That is the agenda that the city council is pursuing. So you have to ask yourself, does Formosa want to become the Green Idea City, or do we want to keep ourselves the best little beach city? Last but not least, Mayor Campbell. <laughs> I really want to thank everyone for coming. I um, am so enjoying talk, walking and talking with so many neighbors. And there's so much talent and goodwill in this city. And I think, frankly, it's a little undertapped. And, and all of you do a lot. but. I think there's genius to be mined and throw them in their hills, and actually, that's something I know how to do. I do that for a living. But anyway, these are five-year council terms, and everybody who said so is right. Um, in my view, this is an incredibly important uh, time in our town. One of the reasons I leaned in to file to run for city council is because we have the first master plan in almost 40 years, something I can really sink my, my teeth into. Um, I didn't think I had time to tell this story, but I think it might sum it up. I was the assistant vice president at, for organizational effectiveness at USC for 15 years. I worked across all of the USC campuses and all of the functional units. And my boss, Charlie, um, we had a shooting on campus in 2012 on Halloween. It's first on-campus shooting ever. And the president lost his mind, and he wanted uh, a closed campus. USC doesn't have a closed campus. By the time the students returned from winter break, so Halloween, over the holidays, to January 13th. And this required such an enormous task of coordinating uh, capital construction to put up fencing and the Department of Public Safety to uh, create um, an elaborate uh, schedule and reading contract um, security to supplement what we had. Uh, signing in, signing off, protocols coming on campus for staff and faculty, communications to students, parents, and the community. It went on and on. My, my boss, Charlie, brought me in and said, Mary, I got to put you in charge of this because I don't know anybody else who can pull it off. And so, and, and I am in the same division with the Department of Public Safety. But what I do is I understand complex uh, functional systems with many, many moving parts. I'm a systems thinker, and I am designed and trained and educated create efficiency, effectiveness, and move things down the road. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Every single one of you has worked so hard. You've clearly put in so much time it's all to volunteer to serve our city. And we all really appreciate it. Thank you so much for putting your time in and for being so eloquent. All of you did a wonderful job. Um, Thank you.